Taylor. I'm Kat. And welcome to Square Mild Murder. I just did a weird, weird like little t- salute. Tip there? of the hat, like salute motion that no one except for Kat can see. Yeah. So it, it was beautiful, you guys. Yeah. It's a it's great. A tear to my eye. <laughs> Actually, so, that's just the pollen making my eyes itch. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that that's where we are uh, t- this week. <laughs> um, yeah. And and to just go right along with that, we're going to do something a little bit different this time around because why not? As we like to say here, why the fuck not? Honestly, these these are the times that you should relish because these are the times when we just get stupid and weird. Uh, and, and, a, and nobody dies this week. Yeah, so... Yeah, it, it is a nice break from the yeah. last one. Yes, yeah. A little bit... A little bit lighter. <laughs> um, so a few months ago in a Patreon bonus episode, we sort of rambled our way into talking about McCarthyism and the Red Scare in the US during the Cold War and the Hollywood Blacklist. And because, of course, we did, because... Of course. Why the fuck not? <laughs> yeah, why the fuck not? I, I actually don't remember how. I don't either. I don't remember what episode it was. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that we did it. Yeah, we did. We definitely did. did. We don't even know if it made it into the final episode. I don't know either. I can't remember, but I, it probably did because I find we find these kinds of things interesting. So, yeah. you know, um, but yeah, so... In that episode, we said to our patrons to let us know if they wanted us to do an episode on the Blacklist and the Red Scare, because it's something, like we said, that we both find really fascinating. And it gives us a chance to actually use our degrees, you know. Yeah. That, that whole thing. Um, I think it was the MK Ultra episode, actually. Mm. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. No. Absolutely nobody replied asking us to do an episode on the Hollywood Blacklist. No. So, naturally, we decided to do it anyway. Yeah. Because it's our show and we wanted to do it. And more to the point, nobody said, no, please don't do it. And that's <laughs> all the encouragement we need. Like, that's literally the the tagline of this show is that nobody yet has come up to us and said, please stop. <laughs> So we just keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Like, that's all it takes. Like, (laughs) if someone were to come up to us and say, stop it, then, like, maybe we'd just shut it all down. But no one has yet, so we'll never know. (laughs) But, I mean, also more to the point, why the fuck not? Exactly. So It's our show. And there is, like, not so much a crime, but, like, a civil rights angle to it. Mm. Which is is really interesting, so we're going to totally butcher the Constitution and the amendments, but because I I wrote it and I'm not American, so... Look, you say that as if me, an American, would actually know (laughs) about the Constitution and its amendments. It is a bit like the Bible, like the people who reference it most haven't actually read it. Yeah. Like, Mm. to be fair, I did study constitutional history. At some point in my school career, I think in like eighth grade honors history class, but that was a long time ago. And the mostly I just remember memorizing the preamble to the Constitution and not much else. So, you know, it's been a minute. So with that in mind, (laughs) let's get into it. Right. So. Unless you've been living under a nice cozy rock for the past five or ten years, you're probably familiar with the phrase cancel culture, often going hand in hand with arguments about free speech and First Amendment rights, Um, you know, whether it's calling out comedians for blatantly racist jokes that they then try to pass off as satire because of course, or, you know, backlash against Chrissy Teigen bullying teenagers on Twitter or shooting your coffee machine because its makers don't endorse your cult leader. I don't know what that one's a reference to. Um, is it Keurig? 
mm-hmm. the coffee maker. Um, so a couple of years ago is when Trump was president. They the company came out and said something in you know in reference to Trump that wasn't positive. I don't remember the ins and outs, but it was no, sorry, no, it wasn't. It was uh, to do with taking the knee. Oh God. Um. So yeah, I totally butchered that anyway. Um. Yeah, because they were like shooting their coffee machines, and then they were burning uh, Nike socks. I remember that. And things like that. Yeah. yeah, it was around that same time, and people were just like shooting these very expensive coffee machines. <sighs> and I'm like, you already gave them your money. You bought it. <laughs> you bought it to shoot it, so you've lost. You're just now out the money on the coffee machine and the ammo. And the bullets. Yeah. Yeah. Like, duh. Yeah. Yeah, and then there was, you know, I mean it it's it was a trend when Trump was president. Anyone said any any corporation, any company, anything said anything about him, yeah. they would go and buy the products to shoot them or set them on fire. Like, you've lost. Yeah. And, you know, there's not a lot of like thinking through in that kind of scenario, I think. You know. Just gonna mm. just gonna say that. Uh, but yeah, so usually the subjects of these cancellations, if you will, especially men, don't tend to suffer in any real meaningful way. Now, certain groups, especially straight, white, right-wing men, have loved to scream about cancel culture over the last few years, typically from their you know place on, on national television, on a certain certain network certain handful of networks you know kind of yeah, that's the thing it's like it's like network prime time slot how are you being cancelled yeah they get mad they yell there's a lot of pointing they cry about using people's preferred pronouns or the legal consequences for you know storming a, a federal capitol building Half a sentence has disappeared. In reality, though. <laughs> like, nothing, it's not real, is basically what I was going for. Okay. <laughs> like, nobody's getting cancelled. No. Like, whose career has actually suffered? Uh, like, the only person whose career has suffered is Harvey Weinstein, and that's because he's in prison where he belongs. That's because he's in jail, but, like, honestly... I'm su- like, it's surprising that that stopped him, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. But imagine that there were a time in the good old US of A when you could be fired from your job and banned from working in the media be- uh, based solely on your political beliefs or perceived political beliefs. And they actually weren't right-wing beliefs. Belief it or not. Hey. It was lazy, but good. Now, we're not talking about, you know, the Puritans excommunicating women who didn't go to church on a Sunday or burning troublesome women at the stake for daring to think for themselves. I mean, come back in October for that story. Oh, yeah. No. We're going back less than 80 years to a time that some of our older listeners might actually be able to remember. Because in the 1940s and 1950s in America, being a communist, sympathising with communism, or even just being suspected of being a communist or communist sympathiser, could get you blackballed from Hollywood and the entire US media industry. Which is wild, but also not really. Yeah. Yeah. How could this happen in a country that is so vocal about the First Amendment? Well, in the 21st century, the blacklist was almost a ghost story from the days of old. People barely remembered it, and it was rarely mentioned outside of lectures on history of cinema. Mm. But then, in 2016, the film Trumbo came out, telling the story of the Hollywood blacklist. Now, luckily for us... 
amongst all the info out there on the interwebs, there just happens to be a feature on the film magazine's website to tell us all about it, which just happened to be written by none other than me. <laughs> so we get to we get to talk about me a lot as well, which I really like. <laughs> we actually don't. I'm just, you know, it's just according to me. Yeah. <laughs> it is going to become a running theme. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> according to me X number of years ago. <laughs> yeah. 2016, whatever that was. <laughs> yeah. Um, the film's really interesting as well. I definitely recommend it. It's, uh, it stars uh, Brian Cranston. Cranston right? I haven't seen it, of, uh, but I've always um, wanted to. Yeah, it is good. And uh, Helen Mirren, I believe, as Hedda Hopper. Ooh, I like that casting. Yeah. So I'm watching. Didn't even get. There's so much on this topic. We didn't even get to Hedda Hopper. So, oh, well, yeah, watch watch the film, and you'll find out more about her. Watch the film if you really want to learn more about Hedda Hopper and um. Crap. What was the other woman's name? There, there were two of them in. Um, in Hollywood, go two gossip columnists at the same time, and there's a really great season of the podcast. You must remember this all about both of them and their influence over Hollywood media. So, oh. highly recommend. Yeah. So, yeah, listen to that. Watch Trumbo. But before you do that, listen to this, and uh. So before we get into that blacklist itself, first we have to take a look at the socio-political climate that led to the blacklist and the widespread fear of left-leaning political ideas. So, the Communist Party USA was established in 1919 due to a split in the Socialist Party of America following the Russian Revolution. The party steadily gained support throughout the 1920s and 30s, especially during the Great Depression, playing what is described as a, quote, prominent role in the labor movement and strongly opposing uh, racism and racial segregation during the Jim Crow era. Despite this, a lot of their early activity was underground due to the first Red Scare of 1919 and 1920, which led to widespread raids, seizures, and the unlawful arrests and detention of thousands of people, um, hundreds of deportations, and almost 200 deaths. Although the party continued to grow throughout the 20s and 30s, the first Red Scare is generally considered to have played a big part in the constraint of leftist ideas in the U.S., uh, and among many Western allies, which was further damaged in the late 1930s when support for the CPUSA began to wane following the Moscow show trials and a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, which aimed to allow both countries to carve up and occupy Poland. Yeah. It's just great. I mean, that didn't really work out for anyone. No. In 1938, the U.S. government established the House Committee on Un-American Activities, also known as the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC. HUAC. Which is, which is what we're going to call it, because HUAC is a lot easier to say. Yeah. Uh, the committee's remit centred mainly, according to Wikipedia, on investigating, quote, alleged disloyalty and subversive activities on the part of private citizens, public employees, and those organisations suspected of having either fascist or communist ties. So the committee was initially chaired by Democratic Representative Martin Dyes Jr. from Texas. And despite its remit supposedly including fascism of all political flavours, HUAC focused almost all its resources and I think even saying almost is quite generous, <laughs> on communism and leftist political ideas. A report was released in 1938, which claimed that communism was rife in Hollywood. Not totally dissimilar to some claims we hear today about Hollywood and the mainstream media being infiltrated by communists, socialists and enemies of the state. Yeah, it's a bit of a running theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Two years later, former Communist Party leader John L. Leach gave testimony testimony <laughs> gave testimony to Martin Dies Jr. in which he named forty two Hollywood stars as communists, including such golden age names as Humphrey Bogart, Catherine Hepburn, Jean Muir, and James Cagney. Uh, these names were leaked after Leach repeated them at a grand jury hearing in Los Angeles. But within two weeks, all but two names, Lionel Stander and Jean Muir, had been cleared. Stander was fired by Republic Pictures, whom he was under contract with, whereas Jean Muir was yet to meet with Dyes Jr., although she was later, quote-unquote, cleared of being a communist, whereas Lionel Stander never was. Mm. Uh, as the Second World War raged on in Europe, there was a truce of sorts between the USA and the USSR. You know, my enemy's enemy is my friend, that all that kind of thing. But as soon as the victory bells rang out across Europe, the temporary alliance came to a permanent halt, and within two years, the Cold War had well and truly begun. Um, yeah. Throughout the U.S.'s involvement in World War II, the rumblings about communists in America's media and screen industries had continued, but there were more important things on people's minds following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. However, as tensions began to heat up between the two superpowers with such opposing political ideals, these rumblings became a whole lot louder. The second Red Scare... Uh, began in 1946 following reports of oppression in the Soviet Union and other communist countries in Eastern Europe. HUAC revived its interest in communism, and according to our resident expert, Kat, and, and what she wrote, um, <laughs> Middle America became terrified of communists living alongside them undetected. Much like people in the Soviet Union denounced others for reading Western books or asking questions about life beyond the Iron Curtain. In the USA, people began denouncing their own neighbors, friends, and family members as communists. As the focus of the Second Red Scare turned to Hollywood, many began to ask questions, not just about the big names on screen, but also about the Europe Eastern European Jewish roots of Hollywood. Hmm. So... In a very small nutshell, anti-Semitism was building in Europe for many, many years, decades, almost a century, before Hitler came to power. After all, it is easier to make a group a scapegoat for an entire continent's problems if people on that continent already hold some kind of prejudice against that group. Yeah. And it didn't end in 1945 either. Oh, it continued in this country, it continued in the UK well into the 70s. Yeah. Like, anti-Semitism was horrible. Uh, pogroms were a regular thing across much of Europe. And it helped to fuel migration across the Atlantic throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And Los Angeles was a popular destination for some escaping persecution. And many of the original Hollywood studios were founded by Jewish migrants and their descendants. Oh, yeah. In the Cold War political landscape, the flight from persecution and a new life in America quickly became Hollywood as a way for, quote, Soviet communists to infiltrate American society. Oh, unquote. Obviously. In July 1946, the Hollywood Reporter's founder, William R. Wilkerson, published a column entitled A Vote for Joe Stalin publicly naming 11 Hollywood figures as communist sympathizers. This became known as Billy's Blacklist, made up mostly of screenwriters, including Dalton Trumbo, Howard, Howard Koch, and John Howard Lawson. Wilkerson died in 1962, and his obituary in The Hollywood Reporter credited him with being quote, chiefly responsible for preventing communists from becoming entrenched in Hollywood production, end quote. That's a big claim. That is a, that is a big claim. Um, a big swing, but it turns out a bit of a miss because the truth is a little bit different. You see, Wilkerson, according to his own son, 
was not interested in ridding Hollywood of communists. It didn't care. Not in the slightest. It was a lot more personal than that. In 2012, Wilkes Wilkerson's son published an article in The Hollywood Reporter apologising for his family and the publication's role in the Hollywood blacklist, claiming that his father had been motivated by revenge as he was bitter about his own failures to establish a film studio of his own. <laughs> oh, and gosh. they say women know how to hold a grudge. Right? Jesus Christ. Wilkerson. I can hold a grudge. I've never dis tried to destroy an entire screen media industry. I know, right? <laughs> and like, also, it's just like, it's so catty. It's like, mm. well, I'm going to write in my journal, aka The Hollywood Reporter, that these people are bad people. It's like, mm. dude, just chill out. Like, you're... <laughs> You established the Hollywood Report. Right? That's still going now. Like you, you got your claim to fame. Relax. <laughs> yeah. In 1947, the recently established Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, wisely shortened to MPA because that's a damn mouthful, um, issued a pamphlet to studios in Hollywood advising producers and execs on how to avoid including quote subtle communistic touches in their films sure uh the mpa was founded in 1944 on the premise that they were trying to preserve the american way of life and ensure communists had no place and no way of working in hollywood right isn't the american way of life like land of the free home of the brave so technically technically America is about freedom. Yeah. So you can't dictate what people's lives look like. No, no, see. So really, when people say they're preserving not just the American way of life, because we got it here, the English way of life, the British way of life, the European way of life, it racism. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not about freedom for everyone. It's about freedom and no consequences for me. Yeah. That's it um yeah so as well as being anti-communist they are also remembered the mpa as being anti-unionist anti-semitic fascist sympathizing racist and in favor of segregation and other jim crow era laws you know all the all those heavy hitters <laughs> all the things you yeah. don't want to be remembered as no, if, if someone wrote that on my uh, my tombstone, I'd be like, what? No, no, come back and haunt them. Oops. Also, I'm not those things. <laughs> or I try you my don't, best to not be those not things. <laughs> currently in favor of segregation in the Jim Crow era? <laughs> I mean, I'm currently in favor of like segregating most men away from me, but... Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, They, of course... That was a joke. I... If anyone screams cancel culture, we will punch you. If anyone listens to this episode and then tries to use cancel culture as a thing, they weren't listening to begin with, so <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> um, now, of course, you know, the MPA denied these allegations. Um, producing Jewish writer... Maury Ricekind as one of their board members and proof that they were not anti-Semitic and therefore not guilty of any of the other allegations, which is, you know, the best way. Tokenism. Yeah, that is literally, yeah, it's literally like, I'm not racist. My sister-in-law is black. Yeah. Like, I have a black friend. I have a gay friend. I have a blah, blah, blah. Look at Maury over here. Uh, yeah. So the MPA was largely funded and spearheaded by none other than Mr. Walter Disney, who had been very vocal in the early 1940s about communism being to blame for animator strikes at Disney Studios. But in reality, and it has been proven, those strikes were more to do with work conditions, bad pay, and a really bad 
and by that I mean racist, union-busting, overbearing, micromanaging boss. Uh, other board members included actress and gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, uh, philosopher and writer Ayn Rand, and actor John Wayne. You know, the kind and tolerant man who had to be held back by six security guards from killing Sasheen Littlefeather on stage at the 1973 Academy Awards. All she was asking for, on behalf of Marlon Brando, who quite frankly should have got up and said it himself, was, you know, for Native American people to be treated with dignity and respect. Yeah, you know. Yeah, six people had to hold him back because he was trying to kill her on stage. Well, he's a big man. He needs six people. That's not the point. <laughs> yeah. All from a man whose name is actually Marion. Really? Yeah. You didn't know that? John Wayne's real name is Marion something? Oh my god. I did not know that. You know, if you type John Wayne, the first thing that comes up is John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> Marion Robert Morrison. Oh my god. She was just really, you know, a lot of overcompensating thing going on. So this is the kind of people they got on their side. Yeah. And their pamphlet included a list of ways to avoid, you know, subtle communistic touches, including don't smear the free enterprise system, don't smear industrialists, don't smear wealth, don't smear the profit motive, don't deify the common man. Don't glorify the collective. Um, I'd like to lodge a formal complaint about overuse of the word smear. And also, yeah. I'm now realizing I hate that word. It's, it's horrible. It's not a good word. It's awful. Smear. I mean, until 10 seconds ago, smear was like, I smear a cake with a shit ton of icing, but... Yeah, I just don't like it. No, no, we're gonna have to re we're gonna have to cancel that word yeah, it's completely. Canceled. Cancel smear. You heard it. <laughs> Seems wrong. <laughs> Actually, no, because that's a bad thing. Because in the UK, smear tests. Oh yeah. As the cervical cancer screen screening. Uh, do you, you call them pap, pap smears? Pap, is it pap smears? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, don't cancel that. Go and get your smear test. It can literally save your life. But. Don't what? use smear in everyday language. <laughs> no. It's not a word anymore. We, we need to stop saying it. It's not a word. I can't. Oh no. my god. Breaking out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, when it just gets to that point, it's like, this is just sounds. Yeah. You're like, right. So you know how people have a thing about the word moist? Yeah. Like, that word has never bothered me. But I feel about now, I feel about smear how most people yeah. feel about moist. Same. 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 So, okay. we're not smearing anything. We're anti-communism. Yay. So, in October 1947, a revived HUAC subpoenaed many individuals working in Hollywood to testify in front of Congress about whether or not communists or communist sympathizers had been planting communist propaganda in Hollywood films. Gotta love it. Um, early testimony was given by Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan, who at the time was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, not yet president of the nation. Now, both men testified that communism was a problem in Hollywood, with Disney repeating his claims made a few years earlier that communists posed a serious threat to Hollywood, while Reagan believed that some members of the Screen Actors Guild were using communist-like tactics to steer policy. Although he declined to name these members and added that he didn't know for sure if they were communists. So, like, he just wanted the trip to Washington, sounds like. Yeah, he was, like, scoping it out. Yeah, but, like, this is my retirement plan. <laughs> Mr. Reagan goes to Washington. <laughs> um, but communist-like tactics... The Screen Actors Guild is essentially a union. Yeah. So then... Does that not just mean they were uni using, like, union tactics? You would think. Also, like, you're the head of the the union, bro. So. But fine. Fine. Go testify in front of Congress. Whatever. 
Um, now, according to Wikipedia, Reagan's claims against his colleagues led to tension in his marriage with first wife, actress Jane Wyman, and eventually led to their divorce. Fair, considering she's an actress and you're the head of the Screen Actors Guild and you're all like, this thing that I'm, I'm in charge of is bullshit. <laughs> I mean, he didn't really think that through. Oh, no. <laughs> but he he had a different wife for each presidency. So true, you know, Nancy. Nancy showed up just before the HUAC hearings had begun. A number of leading stars and figures in Hollywood established the Committee for the First Amendment in process of HUAC and their investigations into the film industry. So members of the first the committee for the First Amendment included Humphrey Bogart, Judy Garland, Lauren Bacall, Groucho Marx, Henry Fonda, Gene Kelly, and Betty Davis. I gotta say, this sounds like the best room of people to be in. I know. Like Groucho Marx, Judy Garland. But yeah, shit, I wanna be at this party. Definitely. Sadly, for our, like, after-dinner party dreams, <laughs> this committee was short-lived and actually did nothing to help those who had been subpoenaed by HUAC. If anything, it may have actually made it worse. Wah -wah. <laughs> the committee members were all supposedly liberal Democrats, but not communists. But it was later revealed that actor Sterling Hayden was previously a Communist Party member and that many of those called to testify in front of HUAC were known Communist Party members. So many members of this committee for the First Amendment actually came to regret having been part of the committee, and some later denounced the group, claiming they had been duped by communists. They were the ones that wanted the trip to Washington. Yes, true. Because they did, they all went to Washington. True. Um... And while some members of the Committee for the First Amendment continued to have long, successful careers, such as, you know, Humphrey Bogart and Julie, Judy Garland and all the names we mentioned, others were blacklisted. We'll get into that in a minute. First, we need to take a quick look, quick look at what the First Amendment is and how HUAC's targeting of communists potentially violated civil rights. How how we've made that quick, I don't know, but we've managed it. <laughs> uh, all right. So, from this American to all you out there, the First Amendment. Yeah, I, I gave this section to you because you can like correct it as you're going along. We'll see. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> so. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution, quote, prevents the government from making laws that regulate an establishment of religion or that prohibit the free exercise of religion or abridge the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the freedom of assembly, or the right to petition the government for redress of grievances, end quote. The part of the First Amendment that we hear about the most is the right to freedom of speech. And I would say I would argue to a, a, a slightly lesser but still common extent the freedom of the press. Mm. Um, and the freedom of speech part is the one that we're most interested in in the case of HUAC and the Hollywood blacklist. So, according to real life lawyer YouTuber Leija Miller, the First Amendment is quote intentionally vague, as to be interpreted by the courts as problems arise, which means that freedom of speech is not absolute and there are examples of free speech that are not protected by the Constitution, such as defamation, inciting lawless action, and burning draft cards as an anti-war protest, to name just a few. So Legion Miller's video on the First Amendment is linked in the show notes and goes on to place the First Amendment in the context of Elon Musk buying Twitter and the potential implications of like a self-proclaimed First Amendment absolutist like Musk controlling one of the biggest social media platforms in the world. 
Um, So in the context of the Hollywood blacklist, the First Amendment should, in theory, protect the right to belong to whatever political party you want and hold whatever political views you want, regardless of whether these views are right or left of center. However, as Leija Miller explains in that video, there are a number of problems with First Amendment absolutism and that your right to free speech does not trump a person's right to live safe and free from harm, which is why we have defamation laws and laws against hate speech. Basically, your right to swing your fist ends when it hits my face. Yeah. That is the very, very, very reductive explanation of how civil rights and civil liberties coexist and how rights cannot actually be absolute in a society that includes more than just you. Yeah, fair enough. Like, we gotta live with other people, so you can't have it all your own way all the time. Yeah. Otherwise, chaos. Yeah. Um. Now, of course, there are examples of political views not being protected by free speech. For example, if a political party it is designated as a terrorist organization incites violent acts, or encourages members or followers to break the law. So, did the HUAC investigations and resulting blacklists violate the First Amendment? Short answer, yes and no. But we'll circle that back to that before the end of the episode. Yeah. So according to me... <laughs> The names of 43 alleged communists were put on the witness list for the HUAC hearings. Of those 43, 19 stated that they would not testify in front of HUAC. Of the 19 who said they would not testify, only 11 were actually called on to testify. One of the 11 eventually testified, and that was playwright Bertolt Brecht. And the other 10 witnesses, who were classified as, quote, unfriendly witnesses, as opposed to Reagan, Disney et al., who were deemed friendly witnesses. So, are you now, or have you ever been, a member of the Communist Party? So that was one question that HUAC wanted these 11 witnesses to answer, amongst others. Bertolt Brecht answered, but the other 10 Hollywood figures who refused to testify, citing their First Amendment right to freedom of speech and assembly, became known as the Hollywood Ten and were blacklisted in Hollywood. And those ten were Alva Bessie, a screenwriter, Herbert Biberman, screenwriter and director, Lester Cole, screenwriter, Edward Dimitrick, uh, who was a director, Ring Ladner Jr., screenwriter, John Howard Lawson, screenwriter, Albert Maltz, also a screenwriter, as was Samuel Omitz, um, Adrian Scott, who was producer and screenwriter, and Dalton Trumbo, who was a screenwriter and actually became the most well-known mm. of the ten, yeah. hence why there's a biopic about him. And a side note, although Bertolt Brecht did testify that he had never been a member of the Communist Party in the USA, he left the USA shortly after the HUAC hearings returning to Europe, I believe he was from Germany, um, where he lived in various places in Europe for the rest of his life and never worked in America again. You know, fair. I'd leave town too. <laughs> Probably a good yeah. idea. So following the Hollywood Ten's refusal to testify in front of HUAC, Congress began criminal proceedings against the Ten, holding them in contempt of Congress. And in early 1948, the Ten were all convicted of contempt. Following a series of unsuccessful appeals, the Ten began serving one-year prison sentences in 1950. But in the two years between the HUAC hearings and the Ten beginning their prison sentences, Hollywood had been very busy creating a whole litany of rules and regulations ensuring communists would be getting nowhere near film studios in the near future. The Screen Actors Guild voted to make members swear a pledge asserting that they were not communists. The president of the Association of Motion Picture Producers, or the AMPP, and the Motion Picture Association of America, 
the MPAA, not to be confused with the MPA, like I did earlier this evening. I mean, there's just too many yeah. acronyms of the same letters. Honestly. And also, to be president of both at the same time, I think, is just rude. I know. Like, this guy, so the president of the AMPP and the MPAA, Eric Johnston, announced that he would never employ a known communist or a former communist in any of his organizations. <laughs> yeah. um, and as you can probably guess, his word as president of the two major film production associations carried a lot of weight, and many followed in his footsteps. Johnson would also issue a press release, which came to be known as the Waldorf, Waldorf Statement. So a closed-door meeting was held at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City in November 1947, involving 48 high-ranking Hollywood studio executives, including the likes of Louis B. Mayer of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM, Albert Warner of Warner Brothers. This is back when, like, the people who founded them still own them. still there, yeah. Barney Balaban of Paramount Pictures, Harry Cohn of Columbia Pictures, Spiros Skouras of 20th Century Fox, Dor Shari of RKO. All the big studios were involved. I know I've missed some. Universal, I know, is missing. That's all the majors, though, I think. Yeah. Anyway, they're all there. And this was during the golden age of Hollywood, which was a time when these major studios controlled almost everything in American cinema. Along with 40 other studio and film executives was Eric Johnson, as president of the Annoying Acronyms <laughs> Committee, and James F. Burns, the former U.S. Secretary of State. Hey. And he had been Secretary of State, I believe, until the beginning of like January 1947, uh, which is when like, mm -hmm. the new president was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. So, fresh out of Fresh out of DC. <laughs> so, yeah. Big names. Yeah. The Waldorf statement can be read in full online and we'll link it in the show notes. But in essence, it condemned the Hollywood 10 and said that they would be fired without pay and not re-employed in Hollywood until they were cleared of charges of contempt of Congress and swore that they were not communists. Now, obviously, this didn't happen because they then went on to be convicted. Yeah. Uh, the execs and studios involved in the meeting would not allow any other known communists to be employed in Hollywood. The statement implored Hollywood unions and guilds to help the studio execs, quote, eliminate any subversives to protect the innocent and to safeguard free speech and a free screen wherever threatened. As well as lamenting the absence of laws on national or national federal policy to make it easier to eliminate com communists. Yeah, yeah, great. Free speech. Need federal policy to eliminate free speech. Yeah. yeah, okay, regardless of those mental gymnastics. The Hollywood blacklist was alive and in full effect before Congress even voted to convict the Ten of Contempt. Yeah. Mm. For ten years, the Hollywood Ten were kept out of work in American cinema but the ripples were felt far beyond those 10 individuals and their families. In 1952, the Screen Actors Guild authorized Hollywood studios to omit the names of anyone on the blacklist from the credits on a film or films. Uh, Albert Maltz, for example, wrote the screenplay for The Robe in the mid-1940s, but his name was nowhere to be found when the film was released in 1953. I just thought I've no idea if this happened, but I wonder if like it was done retrospectively. So I know like obviously home video wasn't a thing yeah. then. Yeah. But you know, in like later screenings yeah, if there... was the were the credits recut to take them out. I don't know. I feel like that would be a lot of effort. It'd be a ma a major thing to do but... back in the days of actual Cutting and... physical film yeah. roles. But wouldn't put it past Given them. the lengths they're going yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. I, wouldn't, I, I do wonder. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, every year, the blacklist grew until at its height in the mid-1950s, there were almost 200 names on the list. In addition to the ever-growing blacklist, a pamphlet named Red Channels was released in 1950, which listed 151 entertainment professionals believed to be communist or sympathizers, almost all of whom were soon barred from working in the industry. Yeah, and Red Channels was was regularly updated, updated and re-released to keep adding to what was like nearly 200 names. Great! Mm. Um, so HUAC also launched more investigations into communism in Hollywood, and California had its own state un-American committee based in Los Angeles, which was looking into communists in Hollywood. Being cleared also didn't mean you were safe to go back to work in Hollywood. Puerto Rican actor Jose Ferrer was questioned and quote-unquote cleared by HUAC, but his 1952 film Moulin Rouge was protested by the American Legion, despite it being a completely apolitical film. And I gotta say, Moulin Rouge, like sex work, that's like capitalism at its finest. Yeah, shit. So how is that communist? <laughs> I know it's set in Europe. It's a foreign country. Strange accent, strange language. Yeah. Don't make it communist and don't didn't make it Soviet. <laughs> anyway, the American Legion, or the Legion as it's sometimes known, is a non-profit for US war veterans. They are politically active, typically lobbying on issues affecting veterans and big promoters of, quote, Americanism or American patriotism. Yeah. The Legion drew a lot of attention and controversy to the film Moulin Rouge, which did not die down, until José Ferrer agreed to support the Legion in their fight against communism. The Hollywood Ten and others on the blacklist maintained that it was their First Amendment right to free speech, and therefore their right to support whatever political party they chose to. However, by the time HUAC launched its new round of investigations and hearings in the early 1950s, alleged communists and blacklisted Hollywood professionals stopped relying on the First Amendment and began pleading the Fifth. The Fifth Amendment, for those of us who aren't American or haven't seen like gangster movies or mob movies, because they always plead the Fifth. The Fifth is the right against self-incrimination. It's actually about criminal procedure and covers a whole host of things. Yeah. But the part we're interested in and the part that most people know about the Fifth Amendment is the right against self-incrimination. It is also worth noting that being a communist wasn't actually illegal. But pleading the Fifth allowed individuals to not testify in front of mm -hmm. HUAC. However... Invoking the fifth pretty much guaranteed you a spot on the Hollywood blacklist. Yeah, bit of a lose-lose situation there. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's. I think that's the same at any time you plead the fifth. Yeah. Because you're admitting that you've done something, you just, ain't, just don't want to talk about it. Well, yeah, or... Yeah. It's tricky, because it's like, if I'm on the stand in a trial testifying about something i'm under oath so mm. if i committed a crime but not the crime that we're talking about here yeah like under like in theory i would be obliged to tell the court about that crime if it came up so like in some instances it's kind of a it's it's a it's a funky thing. It's a very gray yeah. area. Because like you say, if, if it's not the crime that's been tried and you're not the one on trial, yeah. like, you had, like, like if pleading the fifth is like, ah. So they might have done something else wrong. And if, like, unless you're, like, very small fry and it's, like, a big, like, Rico case or, like, like King, King Ping statute or something like that, where they're, like, now we don't really care about you because we want the big boss. They're going to start looking into you. Yeah. Well, and also, like, I I think there have been instances as well of people, like, 
in witness protection who get pulled into trials, legal proceedings where they're like, okay, it's Mm -hmm. like, is this your name? Like state your name for the court. You can't say that. Like, I'd never thought. I'd n- never or like thought of it in the context undercover of undercover officers who get pulled in and like aren't breaking their cover for trials and stuff. Like, it's a it's a handy tool, and I think yeah. that yeah, like it's and because the amendment does include a whole crap ton of other stuff, it is misunderstood. Yeah, that's- yeah, that's, it's 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 the same as like yeah. the first amendment, in that it's and the second, mm, yeah, which we're definitely not going into. No. Um, but they've been reduced down to very basic points. When the amendments, amendment is the word as well, is the operative yes. word, amendment to the constitution. Yes. But they've all been sort of re- like boiled down to these very reductive, like one line. Yeah. You know, right against self-incrimination, right to free speech, right to own a gun, right to form a a, a well-armed militia. They're so much more complex. Yeah. But anyway. Um. Anyway, that is absolute. That, <laughs> most of that is not important. That's fine. Seems like us. Very unbrand. <laughs> so, from 1947 to 1957, almost all of the names on the Hollywood blacklist found themselves unable to get work in Hollywood and the wider media industry in America. Some did manage to get work, and some worked under pseudonyms, including Dalton Trumbo, who was believed to have written up to 17 screenplays between 1947 and 1960, for which he is still uncredited today. Some like he go ahead. I was gonna say Dalton Trumbo was some of them he has been credited with, and it was ten years ago, twenty twelve. His son's dying wish was was for his father to finally be credited with writing Roman Holiday, which he finally was about ten years ago. Oh. But there's still they reckon between ten and seventeen that either under pseudonyms that nobody knows who they are or his name was just removed, but people think, believe that he was actually the main writer. Uh, that's a lot of films, when you think about it. Especially yeah. in this, like, golden era of Hollywood. I mean, they were banging films out left, right, and center every five yeah. minutes. Like, Roman Holiday, though. That's a big one. Great mm. film. Um, now some, like Lionel Stander, were unable to find work until long in the ni- into the 1960s. Others were not so fortunate and ended up leaving the industry completely. Now, the Hollywood blacklist and supposed communist threat in Hollywood was part of the much wider Red Scare and the McCarthy witch hunts and McCarthyism. Now, we could do a whole episode on that alone, and remember what we said at the beginning, vis-a-vis not being told not to do something, being all the encouragement we need. Yeah. But for the sake of today's episode, we'll kind of skip to the end real quick. I will say, I'd be into an episode like that. Like, we touched a little bit on it, I think, in the Rosenberg episode. Um, Mm. But in in their case, it was true. So... (laughs) Yeah. Uh, around the mid-1950s, attitudes began to change, and support for McCarthyism began to wane. That was in part due to a court case bought, brought by radio host John Henry Falk. John Henry Falk was fired by CBS Radio after being declared unfit for work by AWARE, uh, a private company who examined industry professionals for signs of disloyalty and communist sympathies. However, unlike the hundreds who had gone before him and disappeared from the industry or been forced to work under pseudonyms, Falk fought back and sued Aware. When Falk's trial came to an end, the court ruled that private agencies such as Aware and those who employed their services would be legally liable for the professional and financial damage 
they caused during the blacklist period. It would take until 1962 for Falk to win his case, but the wheels of change had started turning, and they weren't stopping. So, actor Kirk Douglas is widely credited with ending the blacklist, but that's not the whole story. So, cracks began to show in 1956, in the 1956 Betty Davis film Storm, Storm Center, which was the first Hollywood film to outright challenge the blacklist and McCarthyism. So Betty Davis plays a librarian who refuses to remove a banned book on communism from her library. <laughs> so like that was a big no-no. Anything, anyone standing yeah. up to be like, nah, freedom. Everyone can read about communism if they want. Was like, no. Nah. Big no-no. Um, and despite firing John Henry Falk for allegedly being a communist, it was CBS who would make the first moves in the screen industry to end the blacklist. So in 1957, the same year CBS Radio fired John Henry Falk, CBS and Alfred Hitchcock hired Norman Lloyd as an associate producer on Hitchcock's anthology series Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Norman Lloyd had been blacklisted as a communist in the early 1950s. In 1958, CBS broadcast a live production of Wonderful Town, which was based on a series of short stories written by Ruth McKenney, and screenwriting credit was given to Edward Chodorov. McKenney was known to be a communist, and Chodorov had been blacklisted as a communist. I believe Ruth McKenney changed her political leanings. Mm. Because she's described as a former communist, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find much about that on a quick sort of mm -hmm. glance. Uh, but it would still be another 14 months until Hollywood was ready to break the blacklist. In January 1960, director Otto Preminger announced that Dalton Trumbo, who was the most well-known of the Hollywood Ten, had written the script for his upcoming film Exodus, which starred and was produced by Kirk Douglas. The film was being made by Universal Pictures, one of the studios involved in the 1947 Waldorf Statement. Before Exodus was released, Stanley Kubrick's Spartacus, also written by Dalton Trumbo and starring Kirk Douglas, was released. The American Legion picketed the premiere in October 1960, but the picket line was crossed by both Kirk Douglas and, you know, this, this guy, you, you may have heard of him, uh, John F. Kennedy. So, who you know, nah, don't know, no, doesn't ring a bell. Um, and Exodus was released two months later in December 1960, and the blacklist was officially broken. So, as well as the financial impact of being banned from Hollywood, the blacklist is also credited with being partly responsible for the demise of the studio system which had controlled Hollywood for decades at that point. Mm -hmm. There were also many much more far-reaching socio-political consequences from the blacklist and the Red Scares, such as the impediment of many things we deem common sense in the rest of the world being deemed as evil lefty commie ideas, like universal healthcare, paid maternity leave, half-decent work-life balance. Yep. But, going back to our earlier question... Did HUAC and the Blacklist violate the First Amendment rights of those who were blacklisted? Uh-huh. Well, according to the Middle Tennessee State University, HUAC can be interpreted as violating free speech rights. Citing Representative Herman P. Eberharder, uh, a Pennsylvania Democrat, who claimed that the House had the choice of supporting either HUAC or free speech, uh, we cannot do both, he said. I cannot escape the conclusion that the purpose of this committee was not to destroy an existent subversive threat in Hollywood, but to intimidate and control the movie industry. Also noted is the fact that suspected communists were denied the opportunity to protest or read any kind of statement at their hearings without it first being vetted by HUAC. If HUAC didn't like a pre-prepared statement, it was not allowed to be read out. That is very much in violation of. Yeah, your right to and protest. And your right to 
defend yourself. Yeah, and the right is it to petition the yeah. government in I can't remember how it was worded. Yeah. It's not good. It's just not good. Yeah. UAC was never investigated or deemed officially to have violated the rights of those who investigated. And the Communist Party of the USA still exists today, and it is not designated as, you know, a terrorist organization or a danger to national safety or anything else that would mean support for the party is not protected by the First Amendment. And despite the many investigations over more than a decade and hundreds of lives ruined, HUAC never found a single shred of evidence of communist propaganda being planted in Hollywood films, or have there been subversives in the industry, agents of the Soviet Union, or any of their other justifications for the Hollywood blacklist? Yeah. Yeah. Good job, guys. Just a lot. Just a lot of taxpayer money wasted. Yeah. Yeah. HUAC went into rapid decline in the 1950s, and was eventually absorbed into the House Judiciary Committee in 1975 was renamed a couple of times as well to try and escape the <laughs> embarrassment. Fair enough. And that is the story of the Hollywood Blacklist. Whew. I think all this stuff is really interesting. And it is. Like, it's horrible. You know, like, kind of decimated an industry. And ultimately, all for naught, because they didn't quote find yeah. anything that they uh, you know could swear was there but the yeah the only people planting propaganda in the film industry has always been the US government yeah so like that <laughs> yeah yeah bit of a look in the mirror kind of it situation here Especially in yeah. the 40s. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, the um, when we did the the Hollywood deaths early this year, the, the original Superman. Yeah. His name escapes me, but he worked in the US Army and the, they had a whole film yeah, production Yeah, the like, film core stuff. Yeah, uh, George Reeves. <laughs> That's it. Reeve. Reeves? Reeve. Never remember which one. George. Yeah. But yeah, I just think it's so funny. If anyone is like deeply interested in this era of Hollywood and some of the stories from it, I know I sound like a broken record and I've recommended this show once already in this episode, but many, many, many other episodes <laughs> before. But you must remember this does fantastic deep dives into sort of various golden age Hollywood topics. And they've done stuff about the blacklist. They've done stuff about um, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. That was the other gossip columnist. Mm. And like, it is really interesting it's like interesting to look at these things as a whole. It's also really interesting, I think, yeah. to look at them in pieces and like like taking a look at Dalton Trumbo and how this affected his life and his career and his experience in Hollywood. So if anyone yeah. wants more depth that we have not been able to provide here just by the nature of time, uh, yeah. then highly recommend. And also we're just not eloquent. No, also like, so the the um woman who writes and produces and presents uh you must remember this karina longworth is like a really good writer like has written lots of books about this kind of stuff and is just like very sort of regal and elegant and that we are not no but we support yes. women who are very much so yeah um but yeah, this is so fascinating to me. The whole like history of Hollywood to me is really fascinating. Um, and I really loved doing the research for this because I loved getting my old 
film textbooks <laughs> out again yeah. and just like i mean only one actually covered the blacklist and it was like like the key concepts guide but just like reading about like the studio system and everything like that it's like it's so interesting yeah. and yeah i just think it's really great so yeah uh trumbo is a good film as well to look at yeah it's about Dal dalton trumbo he is the most famous person who was named mm -hmm. on the blacklist um i'm sure there are many more stories about those who were named those who didn't come out yeah. of it very yeah. well there are some who took their own lives yeah. yes um partly as a result of some there's some did it of the shame of you know testifying and naming names some out of desperation because they couldn't find yeah. work it was a horrible situation that affected so many lives but yeah it's it's a very fascinating era and when you look at it also in the like geopolitical or socio-political context that to me is what makes it really fascinating because i find the cold war really fascinating yeah, absolutely um oh my earlier point, which I didn't make for once, I saved a tangent. So, Senator Joseph McCarthy actually had no direct involvement in HUAC. Hmm. Which makes sense, because he was in the Senate and it was a House committee. Yes, that's true. Which I didn't really understand a few, until a few years ago how like the American political system worked. So, it, I'd never... I still don't understand how it works, but I've got a bet bit of a grasp yeah so because huac in what I, like what i'd read and what i've been taught huac was always mentioned in like the wider context of mccarthyism and the red scare mm -hmm. i always thought senator mccarthy was had like a direct involvement but obviously senator house committee they're two separate entities so yeah oh. um he actually had nothing to do with it despite normally being named in the same context or them being positioned in the context of each other. Yeah. So, um, but as support for him kind of died away, so did support for UAC. Which makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, cancel culture was once a real thing in the media. Yes. That had real consequences. Not so much anymore. No. Which I think is a nice note to end on. Yeah, I agree. I think we have solved something. <gasps> this is like the first time ever. I know. Wait, what have we solved? <laughs> that cancel culture is bullshit. And yeah. that it was once a thing. And it was perpetrated by the US government. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah. Um... I have been asked by the podcast Gremlin to issue a, a, a formal apology for saying that she had only just started listening <gasps> a couple episodes ago. Um, she, she heard Ooh. that. She listened to that episode <laughs> yesterday morning and texted me from the office being like, rude, I want a retraction. <laughs> So, but was it true? <laughs> yes, it was true. <laughs> but it's... I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> no. Well, to, to her credit, she, for a year and a bit, could hear one half of all the episodes <laughs> being recorded. Yeah, that so, is true. So, you know, and... she did listen, just not to, like, every part of... <laughs> Just not to my side. <laughs> she just heard you talking to yourself. Just, yeah, honestly. Just me talking to myself in the living room. But, yes. Um, so, I apologize. You did listen. Just a bit differently than most other people. Yeah. So, retraction. Retraction issued. Issued, yeah. We'll update you next week if it was accepted. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> Wish me luck, guys. <laughs> no, she's great. I love her. It's good. It's good. We're good. 
I mean, please don't get divorced because unless you're going to get remarried and have the same food at your wedding again. That's the only way I'd support you getting divorced. I mean, I'm not going back to that place after the way they treated their staff during the pandemic. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, please don't get divorced. Okay, fair enough. Well, you heard it here first. Can't. Podcast Gremlin. You heard it here first. We can never get to four. <laughs> uh, so. We saw something. We attracted something. It's been a. A banner, a banner episode. Yeah. Uh, and if you liked this episode, if you liked the show, if you're here, if you're still here and you've never done this, you should rate and review us on your podcast app of choice, especially on Apple Podcasts, because it's a thing. And, you know, Apple, they do everything. So yeah. you should appease them. Um and you can also subscribe or favorite us or follow us so you never miss a new episode. And if you want some cool Square Mile merch, we have some. You can buy it. There's designs that are related to this here podcast type show. And you can find those at the link uh, in our show notes or on our website or by going to squaremileofmurder.store. You know how last week you said the gremlin had requested, uh, once again, we have solved nothing merch? Yes. Right, we can't do that now, because now we've solved something. We, we can just never solve anything again. So, or oh, we could have two designs. We finally like, solved something? <laughs> yeah, like, finally we solved something, and once again, we have solved nothing. Okay. I... You could have it on a bag, like, one on either side of a bag. You could. You could. She also said sh that we had lost her as a design partner um, <gasps> when I insulted her. So that's definitely not why I've issued that retraction for free labor. <laughs> I I have a design idea in my head. It's just communicating it to screen. It's slightly difficult. I have a design idea, too. I think we've actually talked about this a couple times before it's gonna it's gonna happen at some point yeah we'll, we'll get there now if you're still here god why <laughs> and go if, home if you would like to, where do you think people are when they listen i don't know <laughs> i just assume most people are at home or at work if you're at work go home yeah if you're at home go to just... work <laughs> if you're retired go good job <laughs> i'm i'm jealous so if you like the show and would like to help cover the costs of making this podcast and help us invest in the future of this show, because why would you ever want this to end? Right. You can join our Patreon page. Tears start at just one pound per month. Every patron gets regular episodes one day early. A shout out on the show, priority case requests. We got to stop saying that because we have this year planned out. Yeah, but you still do get we get odd requests. So yeah, uh, and a lifetime discount on merch, soon to include. Yeah, finally we solved something, and once, once again, again we have solved, solved nothing. nothing. Uh, and that's just for one pound per month. As the tiers go up, you get even more, including bonus episodes. Because why wouldn't you want to hear more of us? And exclusive little stationary merch that you can't buy anywhere. Yep. So check all that out at patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder. Links are in all the usual places. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> this is really long. <laughs> it is. Uh, but we love it. So yeah. No. Thank you guys for hanging out and we will see you or speak at you next time. Coming at your ears. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>